How can Splunk go from here to here and not melt down? It's absolutely incredible how much data Splunk can handle. So how does Splunk do it? In this video, I break down the components of Splunk Enterprise that enable this insane capability. Splunk Enterprise can be confusing because Splunk is just Splunk, right? As an outsider to Splunk, you don't realize that Splunk has several components that make up a Splunk deployment. A component is a type of Splunk Enterprise that performs a specific task. There are two broad categories of components that everything else rolls up under. They are the processing components and the management components. Management components are things like the license master, the monitoring console, and the deployment server, etc. Those are topics for a different video. Looking at the processing components, this is when we start talking about getting data in, mapping data to fields like hostname or timestamps, efficiently storing the data, then later searching it. The components that enable this are called the forwarder, the indexer, and the search head. The search head is where a user logs in to perform searches on stored data, and the forwarder is what sends the data into Splunk for process. The indexer component is where a lot of the Splunk magic happens. It's here on the indexer that raw data is transformed into useful information. When raw data arrives at the indexer, it is sent through a series of steps. These steps are called a data pipeline and it makes up the route that data takes through Splunk Enterprise. There's a parsing pipeline that simply breaks all of the incoming data into large chunks and assigns global metadata tags. This occurs so that the indexing pipeline can work with a consistent quantity of data. This is a key concept because it's this notion of data pipelines that allows Splunk to scale so well. Because of all the data coming in should have values like host names and timestamps pulled out and mapped to a field that can be easily searched later on, this makes finding data very efficient. It's also here at the indexers that bulk raw data is properly segmented into separate events. An important note here, the universal forwarder and the heavy forwarder components do some pre-processing on data sent to the indexers this helps to distribute the workload. Again, a big reason why Splunk can scale so well. While some Seams leverage database for storing all of its data, Splunk does not. Splunk instead uses a unique file structure it calls an index. Within each index is a collection of subdirectories. These are called buckets. And this is very important, remember that term. Within each index, there are two types of buckets, raw data and index data. Because new data is most likely to be accessed by a search query and older data is less likely to be used, Splunk needed a way to gracefully age data through a few states. This is made possible through the concept of bucket aging and rolling. There are six types of buckets, each one indicating a stage in the Splunk data lifecycle. Starting with hot buckets. These are the first types of buckets that data enters. Hot buckets are buckets or directories that are being actively written to. An indexer can have multiple hot buckets open at a time. Also, be aware that hot buckets are fully searchable. A hot bucket will roll or change into the next stage when either a time limit is reached for its age or the maximum size is reached, whichever happens first. The next stage is called a warm bucket, which is actively searchable, but no new data will be written to a warm bucket. A new hot bucket is created to replace that bucket once it's rolled. There can be a large number of warm buckets open on an indexer. When certain conditions are met, like when an indexer reaches its maximum number of warm buckets, the warm bucket will be rolled or converted into a cold bucket. Oldest warm bucket first. When a cold bucket either ages out or some other criteria is reached, it's rolled to a frozen bucket. By default, when this occurs, Splunk just deletes the data, gets rid of it. This could be a real issue if you have business requirements like compliance that require you to hold on to logs for a specific period of time. Now you can tell Splunk to not delete cold buckets and instead archive them by configuring the indexes.com file to do exactly that. Finally, the last two bucket types. What happens if you instruct Splunk to retain cold buckets after aging out instead of deleting them? They are turned into archive data or frozen buckets. What if you need to access archive data? Archive data is not searchable. It's effectively invisible to Splunk. You can't see it. You can thaw a frozen bucket which is a restorative action initiated by a user on archive data. Thawed buckets are searchable by Splunk. The last bucket I'll mention here is the fish bucket. No, this isn't a joke, it's for real. The fish bucket is not meant to be used by Splunk operators. Instead, it's a source of diagnostic info for Splunk support to troubleshoot data processing issues. In the fish bucket, you'll find cryptic events that contain CRCs and seek pointers. If you find yourself digging around and looking at the seek pointers, you need to get a hobby. 
Of course, everything we just covered is skimming the wave tops of Splunk. I didn't introduce indexer parallelization or cluster configuration or how that impacts data processing. All in due time. 